instability arrived in the form of war in Europe, related inflationary pressures and soaring energy costs. With the economy still reeling from the effect of the job cuts made during the pandemic, India has been among the countries fearing a global recession. The above factors mean there is an arguably unprecedented spotlight on the 2023-24 Indian Union budget to see how the government will react. Our experts today will help to provide expert analysis at a turbulent time. Before we go any further, there are some items I need to mention. First, we will be concluding the webinar with a Q&A session, which you can participate in by asking questions on the chat bot at the bottom right of your screens. Please feel free to send us your queries at any time during the presentation. Second, there are occasionally technical difficulties with the sound and slides coming up together. If you encounter any of these problems, please refresh your window and this should correct it. Today, we have some highly distinguished speakers joining us for our discussion. We have the privilege of welcoming Dinesh Kanabar, the CEO of Druva Advisors. Dinesh is joined by AJ Rotti and Ranjit Matani, who are partners at Druva Advisors. Also part participating in the discussion and offering his expertise is Aaron Jiri, co-founder and group editor at Tax Sutra, India's largest online tax portal. Finally, we have the president of the FICCI. So without any further delay, I shall leave the floor to Dinesh to begin today's seminar. Over to you, Dinesh. Thank you, uh, thank you, and uh, welcome everybody on this call. Uh, we today saw a budget being presented uh, at a point of time when the tax collections have been very, very buoyant. Uh, we closed last month's GST collection at uh, one lakh fifty-six thousand crore. So, being ahead of one lakh fifty thousand crore seems to now be a monthly norm, which is very, very welcome. And earlier in the morning, when uh, both Shubhrakanta and I were on, on CNBC and we were being asked this question as to what do we expect in the budget, we actually said we expected government not to tinker around too much with the tax rates. We were hoping that things would be stable. Uh, uh, we were expecting a bit of buoyancy in the government spend on uh, infrastructure, capital outlay, etc. And if I may dare say, uh, the government has presented a budget, the finance minister has presented a budget which almost ticks all the right boxes. Uh, we, we, we heard announcements for very substantial increased capital outlay, whether it was on infrastructure projects, railways, etc., all of which should give uh, a capital ex expenditure a huge boost. More important, we saw that the fiscal deficit has been contained very reasonably. And the projection for the next year also seem very, very reasonable. On the tax front, a very landmark thing which happened is that uh, traditionally India has had a rather poor uh, tax to GDP ratio. For the first time in the history, we have crossed double digits and uh, are now up uh, 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 over 10% on tax to GDP, which is very, very welcome. And it can go only north from here. The projected collection of taxes for next year at 23 lakhs plus crores Again, a lakh crores, again, looks very, very reasonable, very, very attainable. So things seem to be all on the right course. There were concerns uh, earlier on as to whether the government will tinker with the capital gains tax. And we are all hoping that the government does not do that. And that indeed did not happen, which again was quite welcome. A number of changes, of course, have been brought about on the tax front. And the fine print, of course, uh, always uh, leaves a little bit of nasty feeling, which I'm sure uh, when uh, my, my colleague Ajay Roti deals with and when Ranjit talks about on the indirect tax provisions, we will detail at length. But net net, yeah, I'm on what we uh, saw is a significant move by the government to move individuals uh, towards the new tax regime. The government doesn't want people to be in the old tax regime and claim exemptions, etc. They would rather be uh, that people are on the new tax regime. They've made the new tax regime so compelling and attractive that I'm very, very sure that the government's desire there will be fulfilled. A number of other changes, whether it is in terms of uh, uh, a residential housing investment for capital gains tax exemption, a taxation of life insurance policies, all of which, uh, again, we will talk about and we detail as we go along. But net-net, if I may dare say, uh, a welcome budget, not too many nasty surprises, and overall a step in the right direction. Several times, you know, one has felt that budget really, while it is an annual exercise, should really be a long-term statement. 
we do not need tinkering around with tax rates all the time uh, the government can of course make some marginal changes uh, to deal with the situations that arise but by and large we should have consistency and stability and if i may dare say this budget a step is in that direction a right direction so with that comments if i can invite you shubhrakant to come over uh, offer your macro views uh, and and uh, we'll take it further from there shubhrakant the floor is yours uh, thank you, Dinesh. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, be on this webinar and uh, share my thoughts. Uh, so I'll take a few minutes. Um, uh, you know, I think broadly, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a budget which is uh, balanced and uh, progressive. But uh, what is most striking is the primacy given to growth, which is uh, what as an industry chamber, uh, we had emphasized repeatedly that, uh, um, you know, for India's uh, potential to be fully realized, uh, we must prioritize growth uh, above all else, while, of course, uh, keeping an eye on, on issues like inflation, where while India has done well, but uh, it's, uh, it would be uh, inappropriate to preemptively declare uh, victory. So in that, uh, you know, in that context, uh, uh, public uh, capex outlay of uh, 10 trillion rupees accounting for about 33%, a 33% uh, uh, increase to, uh, to 10 trillion rupees, which is 3.3% uh, of GDP, is a substantial number. Uh, and more so if you account the grant and aid to states, et cetera, which takes that number up to 13.7 lakh crores or 13.7 trillion rupees, which is 4.5% of, uh, of uh, GDP. So that's a, that's a very significant uh, outlay. And, uh, you know, I think the, the, uh, the advantage of, uh, of having a large outlay like this is, uh, is that um, the government is doing, is continuing with the good work in terms of, um, the heavy lifting it did in the in the uh, uh, during the pandemic and its immediate aftermath, uh, and at a time when uh, private sector uh, capex is beginning to pick up, uh, uh, this will be a year of transition, so to say, where um, I think this sort of an outlay helps uh, by the government helps crowd in private sector investment. Um, there is a clear focus on uh, inclusive growth uh, in the sense. Uh, that the the uh, steps which have been taken for the MSME sector, which is you know which was quite affected during the pandemic and uh, uh, whose uh, uh, revival is 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 extremely important uh, for um, for uh, basic uh, for I mean for for all boats to to rise with the tide as they say as the saying goes. Uh, so uh, infusion of uh, nine thousand crores to um, um, to the uh, credit guarantee revamped credit guarantee scheme, which will. Uh, enable uh, about uh, 2 trillion rupees worth of credit to flow to the sector and, and uh, the interest rates to be brought down by about 1% is significant. But equally something else which was, uh, you know, which uh, MSMEs have suffered from is delayed payments. So the shift to, um, to uh, uh, accounting on a cash basis as opposed to an accrual basis, which means that uh, uh, deductions will not be allowed unless payment has actually been made to, uh, to MSMEs. I believe is going to largely address uh, the issue of delayed payments, which uh, which is the bane of MSME sector. Um, that apart, um, you know, I think there is a uh, there is a significant uh, focus on uh, ease of doing business. Uh, this is this is something which has uh, which has uh, gone on right through the pandemic, um, where uh, a lot of uh, interactions were there, including with Fiki to to give suggestions on how to reduce the compliance touch points. And uh, as the finance minister mentioned about. Um, uh, you know, 39,000 compliance touch points have been uh, done away with or eased uh, and close to 3,000 or more than 3,400 um, uh, outdated rules and regulations have been taken out of the statute books. But uh, I think the two measures that she talked about in the in the budget speech today, uh, one is the is the adoption as the of the PAN card, the permanent account number as the common business identifier, I think uh, will will have a big difference, will make a big difference as will the unified filing uh, portal uh, because again there are you know multiple agencies which uh, which pretty much ask for the same information so um, a common filing portal uh, uh, if implemented properly i think will uh, will add substantially to ease of doing business that apart uh, there is of course a focus on the agri sector in terms of um, the uh, digital agri infrastructure which will uh, help address some of the challenges in the sector uh, and sort of bring about the same transformation that uh, that UPI has done for the financial sector. Uh, there is a focus on on uh, sustainability in terms of uh, or, or a green economy in terms of um, uh, significant outlays for uh, the energy transition process. Um, but uh, what I'd like to end on uh, is is the credibility of this uh, intricate exercise. 
which comes from uh, uh, equal weightage to uh, uh, to the fiscal consolidation consolidation glide path as to uh, to growth. So achieving six point four percent for FY twenty three, which was which was the plan, and uh, uh, indicating five point nine percent for uh, FY twenty four. Uh, and a reiteration of the commitment to to go down to uh, less than 4.5 percent by FY26, uh, I think lends credibility to the entire exercise. As does the fact that uh, the borrowing, which is anticipated uh, by the government from the markets at 11.8 lakh crores, is something which is manageable and will not crowd out uh, private sector borrowing. So, all in all, I think it is a balanced, progressive budget. Um, there is a little bit for uh, for everyone in there. Um, and I think it's uh, it's fair to say that we are um, we are very enthused by this exercise because there were uh, you know some comments about whether this would be a populist budget uh, given that it's the last full uh, budget before uh, the general elections next year. But I think that combination or that balance between uh, uh, between uh, prioritizing growth without uh, abandoning uh, the fiscal uh, glide path lends a lot of credibility to this exercise. Thank you. Thank you, Shubhra. Yeah, and uh, uh, this is Arun Giri from uh, Tax Sutra, and uh, thanks Dinesh, by thanks uh, Mr. Panda for the wonderful uh, uh, opening uh, remarks. Uh, but every budget we've been uh, uh, used to two words: uh, big bang, uh, five trillion dollar budget. Uh, you know, an economy that is growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, essentially, two words: big bang is a uh, are two words we have been used to budget after budget, webinar after webinar for the last four to five years uh, this one though is anything uh, like that uh, it is in some ways like the uneventful middle overs of a of a cricket match uh, uh, where you know uh, team still deals in one one and two uh, no no uh, uh, reverse sweep no switch hit no six over a, a third man uh, uh, so uh, so what do we go to sleep no not at all uh, we still have 122 amendments what would a budget be without a finance bill and a host of amendments that always keep a tax professional busy never fails to surprise us or engage us uh, and what do we have a slew of anti avoidance provisions a big thrust on individual taxpayers uh, a push for the new tax regime very clear even from the finance minister's press conference uh, an hour ago that they want the taxpayers to opt for the new regime and a whole host of provisions dealing with tds tcs charitable trusts and what would we all do without that word called reassessment which was introduced in that statute uh, in the income tax statute almost 35 years ago so uh, there is enough and more to keep Ajay going for the next 60 minutes and then Ranjit on GST and uh, and, and customs duty. Uh, and then we'll come back and uh, ask some tough questions of Dinesh Fai, though the finance bill possibly does not warrant, but I have to do, do my job. So over to you, Ajay. And uh, it's a pleasure to be co-hosting this uh, webinar with uh, ITR and through our advisors. Thanks once again, everyone, for a full house. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. So what we'll do over the next 40-45 um, minutes or so is really to go over the changes uh, on uh, direct tax front, which have been proposed. Then uh, my friend and partner Ranjit will uh, take us through the indirect tax changes, which uh, would not be too significant given the fact that GST changes no longer can be uh, done in the budget and it has to come through the GST council, but there are indeed some changes uh, on customs, etc., which Ranjit will cover. You know, one of the things that's always an uh, expectation when a budget is being announced is what's in it for me in terms of tax rate changes, uh, is there something being given for the middle class, the salaried employees and things like that. But one of the things that this government has done over the last few years and not just one or two years has been really not to tinker too much with the slabs uh, and, and have kept the slabs largely uh, same, uh, stable. They've also uh, kept other aspects like deductions for uh, investments for which you would get a relief under the uh, personal taxes almost at the same level again, right from 2014. What they did a couple of years back was to introduce an alternate regime. And those were with different slabs and had five tax rates rather than the three that we are used to, which is the, the 10, 20, and uh, uh, 30. Uh, they had brought in five, 15, and 25 in between and increased the slab. But uh, you know the number of taxpayers which had opted for 
taxing under the new regime were very few. And the primary reason was that it was not attractive enough. While the slabs were attractive, but they were not entitled to any benefits like you know housing loan deduction for one uh, and uh, other things. What it also came with was up to five lakh rupees. There was a rebate given, even if the tax was computed, and you would not pay tax right up to five lakh rupees. Uh, this year, in order to give further push, and like Arun mentioned, to get more taxpayers to get into the new regime, uh, you know, while we call it <coughs> the, the new regime, it's not so new anymore, but we'll still continue to call it the new regime because when compared to the other one, this is the newer one. Uh, they have now uh, changed the slabs. You can see the comparisons uh, in the table. So instead of 2.5 lakhs now up to 3 lakhs is uh, not ex is not taxable 3 to 6 lakhs is taxable at 5% and so on uh, you see the slabs there what they've also done is increase the rebate right up to 7 lakh rupees which means uh, anybody earning up to 7 lakhs today does not pay any tax because even if you compute the tax you get a rebate and you will file your return but you will not be taxable up to 7 lakh rupees they've brought in a standard deduction of 50000 uh, so this does make the new regime slightly more attractive uh, does it go all the way but you need to do a computation as to what uh, whether you want to be in the new regime or continue in the old regime earlier you had to opt it to the new regime therefore the default was the old what has been announced now is that the new regime becomes the default and therefore you'll have to uh, opt into the old in case you want to get into the old regime they've also reduced the surcharge for the highest slab you know, once you were above 15 lakh rupees, when 30% was applicable, there were different surcharges applicable for up to 1 crore, 2 crores, 5 crores. And uh, the highest slab, which was above 5, was effectively at 42%. That has been reduced. So there the surcharge was 37%, which has been brought down to 25. So what was the peak rate of 42 odd percent will now be 39. So there's effectively a 3% reduction in the highest slab rate. That's the biggest change, which was really the surcharge for super rich, which has been brought down. Otherwise, there are no changes in the slab for the old tax regime that continues as is. They've also got in a few other changes for personal taxes. The big one being, uh, you know, something that Dinesh mentioned a while back, which is if you got capital gains, you could get a relief from that capital gains if you purchased a house property. So let's say you sold some shares and had a gain. You could purchase a house property and up to two were permitted. And you know you could you could buy a house property and not pay taxes on capital gains. Earlier, there was no limit to that. So you could have a, a capital gains, for example, of 50 crore rupees and buy a house for 50 crore rupees. You would not have a tax on capital gains, very simply put. Now, they have restricted that. And they say that that exemption will be or that benefit will be available only if you purchase a house which is costing 10 crores or less. Uh, that's one significant change. There are changes on uh, life insurance policy receipts which are there. Receipts including the bonus that you get from insurance policies with an aggregate premium of uh, about 5 lakh rupees will be taxable under other sources. And deduction is allowed for the premium paid if you have not otherwise claimed it. So if you have claimed premium deduction under 86, ATC, et cetera, or other sections, you will not get it. But if you have not, then you get a deduction for the premium paid. But the receipts from the insurance policies will become taxable if the premium is more than 5 lakh rupees. Uh, income is still exempt in the case of death of an insured person. These are applicable for all policies which are issued after 1st April 2023. This is an important thing to note. This is not for receipts after 1st April 23, but policies issued after 1st April 23. Deduction under uh, uh, for housing loan interest, interest paid on uh, borrowed capital for housing loan. If you have claimed once, you will not get it again. This was just uh, more of a, uh, to ensure that there's no double deduction and nothing too significant there. There's a new computation mechanism that's proposed to be provided for valuing accommodation in case of salaried employees. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what uh, that will be. The last point on this slide relates to a gift given by a resident to a non-resident. So a resident gifting money to a non-resident was in the past claimed to be not taxable and the non-residents were not offering to tax. So section 9, which uh, really deems certain income to be accruing or arising in India was amended 
a few years back to bring in within its ambit any gift given by a resident to a non-resident. Now they have extended that to even gifts which are received by a resident but not ordinary resident and that would become taxable in India because it will be sourced in India. <coughs> Going to the next uh, you know, important uh, aspect and something that's really become very important for our economy. Uh, the FM also mentioned that uh, we are in the top three uh, of incubators of startups and for the startup economy. Uh, and for the last few years, there have been specific tax regimes, relief, uh, you know, uh, different treatment given for some of the startup related uh, aspects. Uh, one of the things was there's a tax holiday given for startups and there was a sunset so to say that if there are startups incorporated up to first 31st March 23 were eligible for the tax holiday and could become an eligible startup on obtaining certain registrations. Now that period has been extended by one more year, which is if startups are now not just on 31st March 23, but if they are incorporated between 1st April 23 and right up to 31st March 24 for another year, you can uh, apply for that registration and become an eligible startup for a tax holiday under section 80 IAC. There was also a relief given for, uh, you know, carry forward of losses. As the law stands for all companies, uh, if there is a change in shareholding of more than 51% in any year, then all the losses, business losses, which are there right up to that year lapse because there's a change in control, there's a change in shareholders. Therefore, you don't get the past losses. There was a relaxation provided uh, to startups, to eligible startups, which are approved for a seven year period to say that if you change it, if the change in shareholding happens in the first seven years of incorporation, then you don't lose those losses. This was very critical for those startups which were raising capital and therefore had to dilute their uh, shareholding, change the shareholding where the promoters would dilute, therefore would lose the control or would lose fall below 51%. Now that period of seven years from the date of incorporation is proposed to be increased to 10 years. Of course, this will again be welcome because the time to incubate and for startups to become profitable has been slightly longer. And therefore that seven to 10 year period for raising further capital by diluting more will be a welcome move. There was a provision which was brought into the statute as an anti-abuse provision for a variety of reasons in the past to say that if companies are issuing shares at a value greater than the fair market value and there was a prescribed mechanism for the fair market value computation. If the share issues were greater than that value, then whatever is the excess received by the company over and above the fair market value is taxable in the hands of the company. This provision was applicable only to those shares issued to resident Indians. Now this is being uh, extended. So irrespective of the residential status, the amounts now will have to, will become taxable. It's above fair value. What this means, is earlier companies issued shares to resident, they had to test the fair market value and see if it is below the fair market value or at the fair market value. For non-residents that was not being checked going forward, we'll have to uh, apply those tests. And if even on shares issued to non-resident, if the issue price is greater than the fair market value, then that becomes taxable in the hands of the Indian company receiving that money. There's some changes that have been proposed on uh, REITs and inmates or business trusts as they are called uh, for income tax purposes. One of them is a positive and welcome uh, change. And the other one is actually an unintended consequence, which has been clarified or as some people may put plug because that's how the finance bill memorandum also calls it, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, tax avoidance measure being plugged, uh, et cetera. So the first one is under the income tax statute, a recipient of any money where withholding taxes are applicable has a possibility or has a right to approach the tax office to get what's called a lower withholding certificate in certain situations to explain that his case or her case does not warrant the prescribed rate of deduction, but a much lower rate of deduction. The tax office verifies the claim and issues a certificate, which would be given to the payer to deduct tax at a different rate. Those were not applicable or were not available for unit holders of REIT. So whatever be the situation, unit holders of REIT were always suffering TDS or tax deduction at source at the prescribed rate in the statute. 
there was no avenue for them to approach the tax office to obtain a lower rate of deduction. Now, the law has been amended and even unit holders of retained inmates can approach the tax office to obtain a lower withholding certificate. The second uh, change on relating to REITs and inmates is a very interesting one. REITs and inmates are very specific categories of investment vehicles and this was, uh, you know, SEBI permitted or rather brought in the enabling provisions very few years back and we have a handful of REITs and inmates which are listed. The SEBI regulations mandate, like in most other parts of the globe, mandate REITs and inmates to distribute their cash surplus on a quarterly basis. So the SEBI regulations mandate that all REITs and inmates have to distribute their cash surplus, 90% of the cash surplus at least, on a quarterly basis. The REITs in which were provided a special tax treatment, which is a pass through status, which really meant any income earned by the REIT would get taxed either in the hands of the REIT or in the hands of the unit holders and only once. There were certain streams which were taxed in the hands of the REIT or the trust and the certain other streams which were taxed in the hands of the unit holders. The REITs would invest the sums received by them in different forms into the SPVs, which were the asset owning SPVs. So it could have been in form of subscription to equity, debt instruments, or a pure simple loan for working capital or for expansion. And these SPVs would return these monies with interest on a quarterly basis, monthly basis. Therefore, that would become the surplus of the REIT. The pass-through status meant that the income would retain the same character in the hands of the unit holder as the REIT. Therefore, when REITs distributed these surplus cash, it could either be an interest, it could be rental income, it could be capital gains, or it could be this repayment of loan which they have received. All REITs and INVITs consistently took the position that these distributions which are repayment of loan are not taxable and the law very clearly supported that position to say that this is not taxable in the hands of the unit holder. Now, what the proposal in the budget says is that this double non-taxation, which is not taxing of those repayment of loan in the hands of REIT and the unit holders was an unintended consequence. And it was never meant to be not taxed in both the hands. And they have now brought in a provision under section 56, which really makes this repayment of loan uh, income from other sources taxable in the hands of the unit holder. Therefore, uh, these repayments, which were hitherto not taxable, become taxable. And this is applicable for distributions after 1st April 2023. And please note, these are taxable as other sources. Therefore, they're taxable at slab rates. And you don't get either the beneficial rate of capital gains, nor the beneficial uh, surcharge rates applicable to dividend income. This is a very important change because a lot of the REITs had significant portion of their distribution as repayment of loan. This provision is likely to impact the post-tax returns of the REITs and inmate unit holders. There are certain incentives announced for IFSE. This is something that the government has been doing for the last few years. This is a flagship program which they've been wanting to uh, make it successful for setting up units in the IFSE with the international. <clears throat> uh, and these, there was an exemption provided for funds which relocated into the IFSE. And there was an exemption for the shareholder on relocation of the funds to IFSE from wherever else that they were. That was available for relocations, which happened up to 31st March 23. There's been a two year extension given for that. Therefore, funds can now relocate after 1st April 23, right up to 31st March 25, two more years and obtain or get be eligible for this exemption. Also, income of non-residents from the overseas banking unit, uh, which was earned uh, by offshore derivative instruments, which could have been capital gains, et cetera, which were exempt. Now that exemption has been extended to any income which is distributed on account of that. So it could be interest or it could be dividends or any of those things, which shows the underlying income of those offshore derivative instruments will continue to be exempt in the hands of uh, the non-residents who hold those units. Uh, recently or a, uh, a while back, the categorization of uh, NBFC was changed by RBI. This is just a consequential amendment. Uh, the income tax law, especially on 43B and 43D, are being amended to be in line with the new categorization that RBI has come up with. 
The second bullet that you see on this slide relating to NBFCs is a very important uh, change. This relates to the thin capitalization norms. Uh, India brought in thin capitalization norms a few years back, which is to say if the company in question is thinly capitalized and therefore has significantly higher debt than equity and the interest cost is significantly high, then there would be a restriction on deductibility of interest. These are again, thin cap norms are uh, there globally to prevent uh, use of arbitrage of tax rates between uh, equity and interest and using uh, good treaty jurisdictions to take out interest as a deduction and therefore it's an anti-abuse provision. This unintended consequence here was certain NBFCs which had to be thinly capitalized because of the nature of business were getting impacted. Now, there is a provision that is proposed to exclude NBFCs from these thin capitalization norms. Again, a welcome move. This applies for transferizing cases, but does uh, now does uh, exclude the NBFCs from the thin capitalization norms. Uh, you know, this slide, if I were to go by uh, all the expectations that we had before the budget announcement should have been a session by itself on the changes relating to capital gains. There was an expectation that there would be a rationalization or change or overhaul of the entire capital gains regime because there was a complexity in different categories of asset, each of them having a different period of holding to qualify as to short term, long term. We had a 12 month, 36 month, 24 months uh, period. There were also talks before the budget by some officials of the finance ministry to say that there would be changes on this and simplify capital gains, uh, et cetera. The market was also expecting that. But there are no changes relating to any of those things on capital gains. There are certain things, uh, very small changes, again, uh, not of too much significance that have been made. One is in terms of self-generated intangibles, the cost of acquisition of those are now prescribed to be nil, which is zero. Earlier, it was cost of acquisition of self-generated goodwill was zero. Now it applies to all intangible assets or other rights. Similarly, there are no cost of improvements permitted and that will be taken to be nil. Now, these cost of improvement would be applicable to any intangible asset, not just self-generated. So you could acquire an intangible asset and the acquisition cost will be your cost of acquisition because you've acquired it and it's not a self-generated asset. But for those assets, if you do any improvements, there are further developments, et cetera, those don't become a cost anymore. There are exemptions now provided for conversions of conversion of gold into electronic gold receipts and vice versa. Uh, this again, period of holding and cost of the earlier holding will be available. There are certain capital gains exemptions provided for market link debentures, uh, transfer and redemption of those will be deemed to be short term capital gains. Uh, therefore, that will now be applicable at taxable at normal rates rather than being taxed at 10% earlier. <clears throat> Some small changes uh, in business income. One is on <laughs> benefits and perquisites, uh, partly or fully in cash. Now, those are taxable as business income. Section 28 has been amended to include them and bring them within the ambit of uh, 28. Now, uh, this consequently, those will be liable to 194R deduction uh, under a specific category. Now, we'll have to wait and see whether uh, this will impact some of the settled decisions. Uh, we are still uh, examining whether this could impact rulings like the Mahindra and Mahindra ruling on the write-off of uh, loan and whether that would become a benefit or perquisite and is there a possibility that uh, things like that could get impacted by this. But otherwise, this is just a provision that's been brought in to uh, you know, expand the uh, tax base, etc. to include certain things as benefit and perquisite under business income. There's a provision relating to valuation of inventory as per ICDS, where the tax authorities have been granted powers to initiate special audit for inventory valuation. And it could be done by a cost accountant. Like any other special audit today, if you do a 142 to capital A special audit, the period taken for that special audit gets excluded for computing your period of assessment. A similar thing would apply here, where inventory valuation is also being referred to a cost accountant. The 15% concessional tax regime, which was available for new manufacturing units, which commence manufacture before a specified date has now been extended to cooperative societies also. Again, subject to certain conditions, 
and these cooperative societies need to be commencing before 31st March 2024 will be eligible for the beneficial 15% rate. <laughs> the tax holiday under section 10 double A, which was applicable for SEZ units, uh, interestingly never had a condition which mandated the collection of those export receivables within prescribed time. The tax holiday which was applicable for STPI units or EOU units under the SWIL 10A and 10B always had conditions which required them to realize and receive the export receivables within a period of six months or as may be extended by the competent authority which used to be the RBI. Uh, and you, you, know, you had those provisions built in into the section, but 10AA never had that. After so many years of that being on the statute, they have brought in this condition now for even the SEZ units to realize the export proceeds. This has been brought in prospectively and also brought in a provision requiring the SEZ units or the companies operating or owning the SEZ unit to furnish tax returns on or before the due date for them to be eligible for the tax holiday. On presumptive taxation, there's been a change proposed to not permit set off of losses or unabsorbed depreciation uh, before you apply for the presumptive tax rate on uh, the receipts that would be covered by the presumptive taxation. <coughs> As a support for the small and medium enterprises, there are a couple of uh, provisions which are uh, proposed to be amended. One is there is an increased threshold available for opting for presumptive taxation if you are a, a MSME. The turnover threshold has been increased to 3 crores for small businesses and 75 lakhs to professionals. Earlier, it used to be 50 lakhs for the professionals. Similarly, they have brought in a provision to as, as a provision to en enforce that people who are dealing with MSMEs will make payments on time as mandated under the MSME Act. Uh, so this is a penal provision for the payer who has accounted for any MSME uh, you know, transactions as a deductible expense that the such a deduction for any payment being made to MSME will be allowed on payment basis. And if it is not made within the due prescribed period mandate under the MSME Act, this has been brought in under section 43D. Some provisions, again, relating to administration on business reorganizations, you could file a modified return, both the predecessor and the successor in cases where there was a business reorganization. Now there are provisions which have been brought in, <laughs> which allow the assessing officer to revise the assessment order. If order has already been passed, when you file the modified return, post you into a business reorganization, or in case where assessment is pending to consider the modified return before you finalize the order. This is something similar to the 92 CD or those provisions which relate to a modified return filed pursuant to a APA. Uh, similar provisions have been brought in here to say that if an assessment order has already been passed, then you can actually modify or rather revise the order based on the modified return. Uh, it's also now possible to modify the return filed by the predecessor wherever required. Few changes on a tedious uh, provision. Uh, which is relating to payment of interest on lit listed debentures, uh, exemption from TDS provision on interest payable in case of uh, DMAT, DMAT securities, which is listed is proposed to be removed. Similarly, tax withholding on payments to non-residents uh, in respect of mutual fund units will now be restricted by the treaty rate under 196A. Uh, Therefore, if treaty rate is beneficial, it will get restricted to that. The third provision that you see or the proposal that you see which is put on the slide is an uh, important one. This has been an uh, issue for a lot of taxpayers, which is section 199, which is on the statute today, says that you will get TDS credit in the year in which the income is offered to tax. And there was always an issue of certain mismatches. Uh, the classic case could be, you know, cash versus mercantile if the two people involved in the transaction are following different things or take a situation where a company which is uh, obtained certain services accrues uh, the expenses on a provision basis and because of which you need to account for it and you need to account for TDS because even if there's a provision made, whereas the recipient of the income or 
the provider of the service doesn't account this income in that particular year as a unearned income, then there was a mismatch. Therefore, the TDS would happen in one year and the income would get offered in another year. And because of these mismatches, there was routinely litigation where TDS credits were denied, income reconciliations had to be permitted, and the officers on ground will always say that as per law, <coughs> a strict reading of 199 restricted them from providing a credit if the corresponding income is not offered to tax. Now, a provision is proposed to be introduced, a very welcome one, to say that TDS credit would be available irrespective of year in which the withholding actually happens. And if that income is already offered to tax in the past, you'll get a TDS credit by making an application with the assessing officer and you could get it. This is a very important provision. Uh, lastly, TDS has been introduced on online games. Uh, again, over the last few years, we've been seeing TDS provisions being expanded to different uh, you know, payments. Uh, it was for e-commerce transaction. Then last year it was for non-cash perquisites paid. Uh, the 194R was brought in. The government is using some of these data to get the tax base widened. And similar thing, another transaction gets included this year onwards, which is the winning from online games. There are some changes on TCS provisions which have been made. The amounts of TCS has been increased. One significant, uh, you know, uh, payment where TCS has been increased is on the remittances made under the liberalized remittance scheme or the LRS for overseas remittances. It used to be a 5% TCS that the bank has to do on the payments that are made. Now that has been increased to 20%. And this is going to be again of a significant impact, not just for, uh, you know, people who are using the LRS for investments and so on, but also for other remittances like which are nothing to do with uh, taxation or capital gains, etc., for uh, say uh, fees for education of kids and things like that, where you're using the LRS route, those will be available as credit will get reflected in the 26 years of the remitter. But that limit has uh, the T TCS rate has increased from 5 to 20 percent. Certain key changes on <clears throat> uh, litigation dispute resolution. <clears throat> One, uh, the most important change in this would be introduction of a different first appellate authority, which is the Joint Commissioners of Commissioner of Appeals. As we speak today, the way the law stands is the assessing officer passes the order. And unless you've gone through a DRP route, which is a collegium of three commissioners, the, uh, the appeal, the first appeal against such an order lies with the CIT appeals or the Commissioner of Income Tax Appeals. It's of a, a rank of commissioner. The highest pendency today, uh, leaving uh, you know other issues purely on tax disputes is very high at the CIT appeals level. And the government has been trying uh, very hard over the last few years to reduce the pendency at the CIT appeals level. Some of the schemes that have been brought in for dispute resolution have aimed at that. What the FM announced today was to say that there are certain small cases which can be handled by a joint commissioner rather than a commissioner appeals. So they have introduced the uh, different appellate route for joint commissioner appeals. The powers are commensurate with CIT appeals, which is the first appellate authority. Identified orders are to be appealed before joint commissioner appeals as an alternative to CIT appeals. And those orders get appealed to the tribunal thereafter. There are certain provisions introduced uh, to <coughs> widen the scope of orders which are appealable to the tribunal. Here, one of the important aspects which has been amended here is that today, if an order is passed pursuant to a DRP direction, then uh, such an order, a taxpayer can file an appeal to the tribunal. And whereas the income tax officer does not have a right to appeal anything against a DRP. What's been proposed now is in those cases where a taxpayer has filed an appeal arising out of order passed pursuant to DRP, the income tax department has been provided now the powers to file a cross objection to those appeals. This is an interesting change because until now, any relief obtained at the DRP level was final insofar as the SSE was concerned or the taxpayer was concerned because the department did not have a right to appeal on those matters. Now, through these cross objections, some of the uh, findings or some of the uh, you know rulings 
and conclusions drawn by the DRP can now be challenged before the tribunal. This is an interesting provision, uh, has both uh, pluses and uh, minuses. Uh, there's a, a, a small uh, change that's been brought in on prosecution proceedings on uh, liquidators on account of non-compliance. Few things on <clears throat> assessment and reassessment proceedings. The time limit for assessment has now been increased uh, again back to 12 months for regular returns from the end of the assessment year. Therefore, from AY 22-23 onwards, the time limit is again uh, 12 months. The time limit has also been increased uh, in case of search and seizures are pending. A time limit to furnish return of income upon uh, reassessment proceedings has in increased to three months. A few uh, changes relating to refunds which are there. One important change relating to refund is where there's a, a refund determined subsequent to a preliminary assessment proceeding, uh, which is a 143-1. The department had the powers not to issue the refund and wait till the final assessment. Now, they've been granted the powers to set off even those refunds against demands raised under 245 and continue to withhold only the balance. Uh, time to furnish a TP documentation to the transferring officer has been reduced to 10 days from existing 30 days. Some changes relating to charitable institutions and trusts. <laughs> there was an exit tax applicable for those charitable institutions whose uh, registration was cancelled or you know, by surrender or cancellation by the act of the officer. If there was an order passed cancelling the registration, then there was a liability to pay exit tax. And some of the uh, trusts were not renewing their registration. So you had a registration for a particular period of time and then you don't renew it. So effectively you've given up your uh, registration but you were not paying exit tax. Now they have brought in a provision to say that even those institutions which are not applying or renewing after a specified time period will be liable to pay this uh, exit tax. There are donations which are made by charitable institutions to other charitable institutions like a pass-through, and if those are done, the application in, of that has been restricted to 85% from AY 24-25 onwards. Therefore, you may get 100 and pass it on to another charitable institution. It will not be considered as you made a 100 uh, rupee deduction, uh, 100 rupee contribution or application of income in that situation. It now gets restricted to 85%. There are a few changes proposed on application out of the corpus fund. And if, you know, corpus fund or loan that were received before 31st March, uh, repayment is not allowed as an application. If it is received after 31st March, it's allowed only if it is made within the five-year period uh, from there. So these are uh, very quickly and briefly the changes around direct access which have been uh, announced. We'll be available to take questions after, after uh, you know, Ranjit finishes uh, his indirect tax proposal. I'll hand over the proceedings to Ranjit for us to uh, for him to take us through the changes announced relating to indirect taxes. Thank you, Ajay. Uh, there's there's a uh, sort of last segment that we need to cover here. Although the finance minister brought this uh, set of proposals before the direct tax proposals breaking away from tradition. Um, she, uh, of course, laid out the aims of the uh, indirect tax proposals that she had, which is to promote exports, to boost domestic manufacturing, to enhance the domestic value addition, and encourage the green energy and mobility sectors. Now, in that context or in that background, there have been some sort of proposals which have been made. There aren't very many of them, but there are quite a few changes which have been uh, sort of proposed in uh, to amend or tinker with the rates. And uh, there's a couple of uh, angles to that. Uh, one is as the aims that she mentioned. The second is that um, in 2020, the WTO in November of 2020 had a report uh, set out which recommended simplification of some of the tariff rates and exemptions that India has. <clears throat> and in that sort of direction and endeavor, uh, some of the rates have been harmonized here, rationalized here. And as we see the fine print of the finance bill, there, there are a lot of uh, rates which have been turned around. There have been some sort of uh, uh, harmonization of the basic uh, customs duty, the AIDC, the SWS as well. And, and we therefore see you know, quite a few changes in the rate structure. 
uh, in continuation of the uh, rate sort of uh, amendment of the structure of, of the duty rate, uh, we had in budget 2021 a lifeline which was sort of given to conditional exemption notifications such that they would run for a period of two years unless they were specifically extended and continued. Uh, there has been now a proposal in the budget today that uh, that sort of limitation of timeline uh, will not apply to uh, exemptions which concern free or preferential trade agreements, uh, schemes which are under the foreign trade policy, for example, the EPCG scheme, uh, re-imports, temporary imports, uh, goofs, gifts, uh, goods which are imported as gifts and personal baggage, and all other uh, duty benefits other than those concerning BCD. So in respect of these uh, duty rates, the notifications, wherever they were conditional uh, from and because of the budget of 21, will no longer have that sort of uh, self-seizing uh, effect and will continue uh, 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 with, with its run. A change which has been made and, and it's in, in the fine print that you know it really comes out is that a settlement commission has been given the uh, mandate to settle cases and pass orders within a period of nine months from the filing date of the application. Uh, this period is of course extendable by three months, which means that you get a lifetime of uh, 12 months for a order to be passed from an application having been filed. Now, <clears throat> Uh, the Settlement Commission has been a body, uh, at least for the purposes of uh, indirect tax uh, matters, which has been non-functional. It was not manned. There have been uh, court orders passed in the in the last year, which have sort of directed this particular issue to have been taken up, and it was taken up. Uh, we now have uh, the the Settlement Commission been being manned. Uh, but what is interesting and and actually quite a uh, sort of um, an un, unexpected sort of uh, amendment is that the settlement commission, uh, if it does not pass an order in the nine or nine plus three month 10 period, the uh, application will abate and it will turn over back to the adjudicating authority who will adjudicate the show cause notice, so to say, as if such an application for settlement was not even made. Now, this can become quite a difficulty for uh, people who are looking to make a settlement under the settlement uh, commission provisions, because uh, the whole idea was to go there. Now, if I'm going to be relegated back to the adjudication proceedings, that's really a self-defeating uh, position to be in, especially when uh, timeline is not in control of the applicant. It's the settlement commission which would, you know, be in control of that. Um, another change uh, in respect of the solar power sector and and therefore concerning solar power plant, solar power projects, is that uh, the uh, chapter ninety eight zero one, which of the Customs Tariff Act, which which uh, provides for the importation under the project import scheme has been uh, amended in such a way that it excludes imports for solar power plant and solar power projects. And so uh, these, uh, sector, this sector would not have the benefit of uh, the project import regulations. Uh, it, it may be uh, sort of just mentioned in the passing that the project import regulations were amended uh, sometime in the last year when the uh, uh, benefit to solar power plant and solar power project was withdrawn. And, and this sort of is now continued by amending the chapter entry itself. Uh, another development in, in the uh, provisions concerning indirect taxes, not specifically customs, is that the uh, central excise, uh, sorry, the customs excise and service tax uh, tribunal has now been empowered to adjudicate the appeals and applications which concern interstate disputes which arose under the Central Sales Tax Act. There was a body which was created, uh, which is known as the Central Sales Tax Appellate Authority, which unfortunately uh, was also not manned quite at, uh, for an elongated period of time. And uh, it has come to a position where interstate disputes concerning primarily branch transfers were pending and were not being uh, decided or did not reach conclusions. So we now have a situation where the SESTAT, which recently had been you know, given a lot of members, have been sort of appointed in there are now required to take up this uh, set of issues and quite important issues because 
that set of issues which are concerning uh, states and therefore disputes between states is something that we will probably also see in the GST regime and uh, the sort of decisions that come out of the, the tribunal in that uh, situation will be of some relevance to us in the GST regime as well. Uh, taking the uh, next uh, slide on, on uh, GST, uh, though the expectation was that there wouldn't be too many GST related changes, there are some uh, that are there and I'm going to talk about a few of those which are the important ones. Uh, of course, most of these are on the back of recommendations of the council which met recently and, and they reflect the sort of recommendations that the council made. The primary uh, amendment that is substantive in nature is the amendment to the online information database access retrieval services, which has been enlarged so as to do away with the requirement of human intervention and also do away with the requirement of it being essentially automated. So the definition of online information uh, database access retrieval services uh, originally uh, provided for a uh, coverage if it involved uh, minimal human intervention and essentially was automated. Now, those have been diluted. This widens the scope. This will also bring into uh, uh, for the fore some amount of classification disputes where assessee may not claim to be or not believe that it is a OIDAR service, whereas the departmental authority will try and see how that sort of uh, activity or supply is within the scheme and folds of OIDAR so that there is then a tax liability that can be uh, fastened on, on, on that case. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> another substantive change, and this concerns um, the, uh, the, the transactions of merchanting trade or inbound and high sea sales, uh, which were to be treated, uh, which are to be treated as not a supply transaction from the 1st of July 2017. Now, there is a clarification and this comes in the finance bill. It's not an amendment that is proposed into the CGST Act that the taxes that have been paid uh, in such cases, which is merchanting trades or inbound sales or high sea sales, would not be refunded uh, if, if there were paid, if there was any tax that was paid. Uh, the, the question, question that remains and, and is, is, is unaddressed is possibly, possibly going to be uh, something, something that will have to be clarified, clarified is what happens to the cases where the taxpayer had reversed the input tax credit. Uh, is he in a position to reclaim that or is that also affected by this clause which says no refund for tax paid in the past? A significant change which has been brought about in concerning ITC is that uh, for CSR spend under the uh, provisions of 135 of the Companies Act uh, will not be allowed for, for the purposes of input tax credit. Now, uh, there was a set of advanced rulings which had gone and clarified so that the credit would be available. Uh, this provision now clearly negates that set of that, that situation. Uh, this also sort of opens up the debate as to what would happen to uh, other sort of uh, people who are not uh, under the uh, uh, Companies Act provisions are not under the, you know, uh, they're, they're different sort of persons like a partnership firm, etc. What would happen to them or the spend that they may have made on a, a CSR or what would happen to <clears throat> spend that is over and above or beyond the provisions of uh, 135 and therefore were, were not an obligation under the Companies Act. Would all of these now become uh, also not available as credit? Uh, so it seems uh, that's, of course, something that will have to be uh, a position that will evolve and we'll have to wait and watch on that. Um, another change that has been made in respect of the input tax credit provisions is uh, for inborn sales to be treated as exempted and therefore... <clears throat> The uh, reversal of input tax credit has to be made in respect of in respect of such sales. A, a, a curious aspect of this is that uh, the there's a differentiation which has been made uh, when inbound sales are to be treated as exempt for reversal. Uh, high sea sales or merchanting trade are not to be uh, so treated for the purposes of reversal, and and it's it's curious as to why that sort of uh, position has been uh, put down. A, Another procedural change that has been brought in is a restriction on the filing of whether it's the monthly outward return, the monthly tax liability return, the annual return, the reconciliation statement. Uh, <clears throat> these are now to be filed uh, within and, and the outer limit of three years from the due date. 
uh, it may seem uh, more like a housekeeping or a procedural aspect where uh, the authorities would probably go after and ensure that there are no cases of non filing and and they have been you know on 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 those uh, situations being quite aggressively following it up this seems to be putting it very clearly that you know we'll make sure that the provision uh, will will ensure that everyone is filed and there is no limitation uh, that you're breaching for the 3 year period a, another change that has been brought in in respect of uh, e-commerce operators is that they would be made liable for penal consequences for uh, uh, supplies which are made where the party may not be registered uh, when the supplier as such would have, should have been registered or in cases of certain other supplies where he is making an interstate supply whereas he was not registered to make such an interstate supply uh, net net what this implies is that an e-commerce operators has to be a bit uh, have to be a bit more vigilant and ensure that you know they are uh, checking on how the supplier is positioned registered not registered enabled for uh, interstate supplies or not and only then sort of go forward and enable uh, those uh, suppliers to be on their portal making a supply the uh, last of the changes i would talk about is the rationalization of the penal provisions that uh, that are there in the gst regime uh, this was something which was recommended by the council a uh, couple of aspects there which have been amended the first concerns the increase of the threshold from uh, 1 crore to 2 crores in respect of most or almost all of the offenses uh, except the offense which concerns uh, uh, invoicing without supplies, i.e. fake invoicing. Uh, there has been a reduction in the compounding amounts. There was a quite a formula that had to be looked at with a minimum, with a maximum, and all of that uh, had to will be worked out. They have now simplified it to provide that it's either 25% or 100% of the tax, and that's the range that has been given uh, for this purpose. And uh, they've also clarified uh, by, by virtue of this finance bill that there are certain situations where the prosecution could not be cannot be launched. Uh, those exceptions concerning uh, uh, obstruction of the proceedings by the departmental authorities, uh, non-provision of information, uh, altering or damaging any material or evidence. Uh, these are, uh, in, in a sense of speaking, not grave, and therefore they have been uh, brought out of the prosecution uh, scheme. And and in in a welcome move, uh, the decriminalizing is is what is I think the overall intent as well of of the government. So these are the uh, key changes that we had to speak about from an indirect tax point of view. And I'll take it back to Arun. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Ranjit and uh, Dinesh. Bhai said that. Uh, we may not have a full house. I said uh, the budget may be, uh, uh, what we say, may not, have, may not have set the Thames on fire. Uh, but uh, when you have Dinesh on the webinar, uh, there is no question of a full house. We have a full house, plus we have people on YouTube. And there are 35 questions that I have, Dinesh Vai. So uh, let's go with the questions now. Yeah. Uh, which one do we go? Yeah. This 28... Uh, for uh, Ajay thought uh, uh, is something that could open a Pandora's box. Let's start with that. Some of the provisions uh, like 28.4, including consider consideration received in cash, prescribing COA for intangible assets, etc. Don't they change settled position of law as decided by the courts? They, they indeed do uh, change the settled position uh, but uh, there are two ways to look at everything in life. Uh, the question is, we had uh, uh, Srinivas City's judgment ages ago, uh, no cost, therefore no taxation. First, we have moved away from that whole principle, which I always say that I learned from Mr. Palkhiwala, that there is no equity in taxes. Either the tax law uh, uh, taxes something or does not tax something. And you go on the basis that if there is no cost, there is no capital gains tax. We had amendment, we had certain assets being made nil, now certain other assets. And the the the, the taxing authorities are coming back to say that if you have made a capital gain and you have not paid something, then you ought not to get a deduction. The amount ought to be fully taxed. That seems to be the sum and substance. And long around, 
the the taxpayers have sort of fooled around with these provisions first it was whether it's manufacturing whether it applies to services then it went on getting expanded and now the sort of loop is closed to say that if you have sold an asset transferred an asset it has not cost you anything then you better pay full capital gains tax and it is not a question of a right or wrong it's a question of really this is what the tax gatherer revenue believes ought to be the position in taxes or you take 284 uh, the question is whether uh, the Supreme Court judgment, Mahindra and Mahindra and all of that, and, and whether uh, if something is a perquisite, only if it is received in cash. And now, of course, technically, uh, uh, there is little to say uh, 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 something which is convertible into cash has to be non-cash. But the question here is that the revenue is attempting to say that any benefit that you have received is taxable in your hands. So uh, that's the way I see it at, from an overall perspective. Ajay, you'd like to... Uh, add a technical perspective to that. Yeah, so Dinesh, I agree with uh, all that you laid out and uh, even on uh, 28.4 amendment uh, in terms of uh, the uh, perquisite that's been brought in. Yes, it does. Uh, uh, like you said, one way to look at it is to say that it does disturb some of the settled positions. Uh, but if in the wisdom of the legislators that this is what has to be done, then that's how we sort of read it. I completely agree with what you summed up. Yeah, we have the next question. Uh, uh, a couple of people asking a variation of the uh, same question, Priya and uh, Mehul. Uh, aggregate premium paid over the life of the policy, Mehul last life insurance premium, aggregate filax or per policy filax? It, it is the policy for which you are getting the money. So it's uh, per policy, but it's aggregate premium, which is there. So you don't take all unrelated policies premium, but it's for the policy for which you got the money, but the aggregate of that policy over the life of the policy. Another one, Abhishek asks, uh, is entire capital gain amount, will it not available for deduction if purchase value is of the house is 10 crore uh, or more? Or will it be restricted? So, so I think what he wants to ask is if the purchase value of the house is 20 crore, it will, it will be completely restricted to 10 knocked crores. off or will it be restricted to 10 crores? It will be restricted to 10 crores. <clears throat> uh, the status of leave encashment for private sector employees. I think leave encashment for private sector employees is the same that's there, but the increase that is there will be available. The whole other thing that we have to see is some of these benefits, whether you offer the new regime, etc. We'll have to see that also. That's another interplay that we'll have to be aware. Of. The next one is from Jitesh Jain. Seems interesting. Amendment in section 56. Does it apply to all investment received by the company from venture funds or people? Everybody. This one is a more educational, so we'll we'll uh, we will uh, leave it off. What are market link differences? That's for another day. Uh, next one is from Shekhar. What is the effective date of proposal of cost of acquisition? Uh, uh, nil for any intangibles. Will it apply to existing? We'll have to see that, Arun. I think it will be. It is prospective, but we'll just have to check and. This one from Manthan again is a bit interesting on LRS. He says, is TCS on LRS being increased to 20%? If yes, does it effectively mean that there's an LRS limit? Is really yeah, so TCS on uh, LRS does uh, increase uh, by uh, 20%. One way of looking at it is, does that cap it? Because that's what you're sending. But LRS applies to what is being sent out of India. Therefore, you could end up grossing up for what you want to send. Uh, and it does not uh, effectively reduce the limit. Because that TCS, whatever is done, is available to you as credit. The money that's getting remitted out is the limit uh, that we'll have to see. Yeah. One, of the you know, one comment uh, I might just like to make there, uh, Arun, is that this is like typical camel entering the tent and then going on expanding. So we began with 5%. Clearly, TCS is not a tax. It's a, a credit available. But you start and then now you go from 5 to 20. So barring medical and education, everything else is 20. And 20 is too steep a rate to have really just because you're sending out a remit. TCS is a tracking mechanism. If it is a tracking mechanism, why do you want to make it 20% is a question one would ask. Uh, Dinesh, my, uh, the one trend, unmistakable trend, uh, which I thought the government may have wanted to address is, uh, is when uh, Morgan Stanley came out with the uh, report and and uh, I think Ridham Sharma, he, he he mentioned it very prominently that $23,000 millionaires had left India, renounced Indian citizenship. And that figure is only multiplied. Is this some sort of an exit tax? 
No, I don't think so. LRS really applies only if you are a resident. Once you become a non-resident, you can't send monies under LRS. So if there is somebody leaving the country, then he's actually allowed to take all current income and capital up to $1 million. LRS is your $250,000 a year. So the two are very, very different. So LRS is really you are a resident Indian per family member. You can send $250,000 out in a year. And on that, you are paying this 20% uh, TCS. One of the top wealth managers asked uh, on another panel, uh, won't you be able to claim a refund? Yeah, of course, it's credit. So it's a refundable thing. But the whole point is that why 20, see the reason for having TCS is that you are tracking a payment. Therefore, the person who is making the remittance does not escape showing it. Okay. Now, if that is so, if it is a tracking mechanism, why go all the way to 20? But that's a rhetoric. Perfect. Uh, Amit asked, uh, clarification yeah. amendment brought in 194 hours to cover monetary benefits. Is this amendment retrospective from July 22 or shall be applicable for benefits paid from 1st April 23? No, all, all uh, provisions which are brought in this time are uh, prospective only. Uh, at least I have not noticed any uh, retrospective provision. In fact, around interesting this budget, even changes which they have brought in, which are clarificatory in nature. Even the ones which we discussed, where we said it will unsettle some of the principles or what has been laid down by the court, all of them have been prospective. And, and I think this, uh, at least this government has been walking the talk on not making retrospective mm -hmm. amendments. We are not seeing any retrospective amendments <laughs> significantly. Online, yeah, finish my own no. yeah, on online uh, gaming, there is a question here, but before that, uh, Ajay, uh, uh, when they say TDS has to be directed on online gaming uh, how will that work because there's so much controversy on uh, on online uh, rummy and gamescraft and everything so uh, how is this going to work on a practical level how will the winnings be calculated i think today when winnings are being distributed uh, you know there will be a tds that will be done and arun it's a age old principle settled long back that uh, legality of a transaction and income don't really go into hand in hand. Even if you're earning income from an illegal transaction, so to say, it's taxable. So uh, the government on one hand may not want to uh, have Rami, etc. But if there is income today, and today if people are earning that, there has to be a TDS. And the liability to withhold this tax has been uh, passed on the company which is distributing that those winnings. So I think it will apply. And this is again, you know, we discussed something similar last year. To say that if there's a tax brought in on virtual digital asset, does it make it? Uh, does that mean that the government is actually not going to ban or not going to uh, clamp down on uh, cryptos? And does that uh, make it legal now, etc.? And I think similar thing. Uh, you know, they may have a policy not to uh, encourage um, Remy and online uh, gaming and gambling, etc. But that doesn't mean if there is income being earned uh, that they'll not uh, tax. Interestingly, in the memorandum and explanation, they say that this is to expand the tax base because there were companies which were paying less than the 10,000 limit going under 194 capital B and not deducting tax on multiple payments. Therefore, they brought it in. Yeah, couple of questions. I think, Ajay, you may have taken in your presentation, but uh, this is from uh, Mr. Venkat Raman. Will 28 amendment apply to a debt written off by a company? Whether the creditor is required to deduct TDS on the same under 194R? So, uh, you know, uh, that's something that we have, we've also uh, discussed. Uh, there could be a possibility, and I, I know what decision is being referred to here, the Mahindra and Mahindra decision, and if it does get uh, reversed in a sense effectively. The way the law has come in, that could be one unintended consequence. There could be a reading taken by the tax officers to say that it does get covered there. But we'll need some detailed analysis there to see if that is really the uh, final conclusion that we reach to or this does cover only those in cash perquisites and therefore uh, does uh, really the right back of loans get impacted or not is something we have to uh, examine and come back. Uh, and and this is a very, very, very significant impact on IBC restructuring. And I think we, we just need to be alive to that. It could just run contrary to whatever the government is trying to do out there. Last question uh, for the day. Uh, this is uh, very out of the box. So may out of syllabus. I, that's why I'm asking. Hello, panelists. My question is, is there any relief for working with women undergoing a divorce? Hi, I'm uh, 
you know, it is out of syllabus thing. I don't think there's anything uh, particular there. Not, none that comes to my mind specifically for my other. Finish me on a at a, on a conceptual yeah. level, uh, very clearly. While there may nothing, not be anything big, big back, no, no rationalization of capital, capital gains, nothing of that. They have saved the powder for another day next year. year. Uh, but we clearly, uh, uh, definitely, uh, the FM has made it very clear. Uh, uh, no words means that they want the taxpayers to avail of the new regime. So, uh, 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 one stream of thought which has gained ground today, especially on Twitter, is that uh, uh, eventually these exemptions under the old regime will go, and eventually the old regime will be disincentivized to an extent where most people will shift to the new regime. Yeah, I would think so. And, and you know, if you're talking about simple law and for court. Corporates, we could do that. We could go back and say that there are no deductions, no exemptions, just have a low tax rate. I don't see any reason why it should not be for individuals. But just at a broad theme level, if I may say so, uh, uh, Arun, apart from all of the fact that the new tax regime will ultimately be the only thing which will in the next couple of years sort of take over and we'll see all the other provisions go. Very clearly, the government is saying, any technical interpretation which results in a tax exemption, we will come out, we'll amend the law mercifully, prospectively, but don't go around trying to sort of avail of hyper-technical interpretations. Mm -hmm. And the fact that nothing much has been tinkered on corporate uh, tax, uh, should it be seen that, okay, we didn't want to do anything, uh, anything controversial, uh, you know, in the run up to elections? Or do we think that a lot of the big ammunition is being saved uh, for a budget uh, sometime uh, mid next? I don't know, but one thing which certainly did does dis disappoint me is that as part of FIKI, as part of my own personal thought process, we had strongly recommended that the 15% manufacturing regime should be extended for other few years because it takes time for companies to set up manufacturing plants. We have seen what happens when Apple, Foxconns of the world come to the country. And we thought that that regime should have been extended beyond 24. That hasn't happened. That's a personal disappointment. I'm very sure that when uh, uh, the new government is in place and they start looking at things, many, many more things will happen. We keep on talking every time there is a uh, budget about wealth tax and inheritance tax. Those are the things which are saved for a later day. Yeah. Yeah. Then it's like right. the last couple of questions. Uh, one uh, a retired <laughs> commissioner, chief commissioner, uh, uh, told me yesterday when I asked him, do you, would you bat for a new code? He, he said, said that, that uh, the, the reason why I bat for it is because I can no longer hold the income tax act in my hand. <laughs> it's too bulky. <laughs> that, that doesn't say uh, a lot of good things about, about the act. No, I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Arun, the way I look at it is that it takes time to interpret the law or the law to settle down case laws after case laws after case laws. But most of the provisions have settled down. When you start putting on a new uniform code, it will lead to its own interpretation issues. I don't think it's going to be something which one can, in, in a country like India, say that there won't be any argument on any provision. And it will take years to settle down. So that's a call which one needs to make. Mm. Uh, nine years. Uh, two, two full, full, uh, full five-year five administrations of the government. government. We've seen mainly two finance ministers, Mr. Mr. Hedley and, and Mr. Mr. Sitaraman. Uh, they, they promised nine years back uh, that, that the tax administration will be revamped that uh, you will have a non-adversarial tax regime. Tax terrorism will be a thing of the past. We will not have retrospective amendments and uh, uh, we will be pro-taxpayer. Uh, nine years down the line, uh, as we you know, get to the end of the second term of this government, uh, the tax collections have been recorded. From 13 lakh crore, we are now almost at 20. We have more than doubled it. From 7 lakh crore income tax collection, you have, have seven, seven lakh crores just of corporate tax collection. <laughs> what a what, what does, does the buy and tax collection reflect? Uh, and uh, B, Dinesh, uh, on all these parameters, how would you rate uh, both the tax administration, the policy makers, and the government? I think we have seen a sea change without without an iota of doubt. The faceless assessment, while it took its time to settle down. If you ask tax practitioners, and today also there are still some issues when you're doing filing, electronic, all of that, but those are settling down issues. Overall, an absolute step in the right direction, less harassment, etc., etc. Uh, uh, on a non-adversarial tax regime, 
sometimes it goes down to individual officers and how do they approach matters and there is sometimes this whole question as to whether the viewpoint which the political class has gets percolated down to the administrative level or not but by and large every single effort so today for example if you ask any tax practitioner a tax return comes fully filled up virtually the time that it takes to fill in a tax return is so much less the orders which you get sometimes are a very very pleasant surprise just because something was added year after year after year you could actually find uh, under the current regime it being sort of accepted uh, your positions being accepted something which is very very unusual uh, you know i i talk about uh, and i wrote about it on the at the tax tribunal most of the tax tribunals today have less than one year pendency you file an appeal today you will get a, uh, a date and that's not something which we have seen in times to come which is something very very welcome there was a bottleneck at the commissioner appeals level today you saw a new change come around to say we'll appoint joint commissioners and sort of try and clean up uh, at least the smaller ones that's what we are looking for so i would say all very very welcome changes any change takes its time to settle down it's very easy to criticize that interim period but surely all steps in the right direction final word in it right how would you rate uh, only the tax proposals on a scale of 1 to 10 no i'm not in the business of rating so i will not rate it all that i would say is that there is tax laws require consistency there has been consistency tax rates require pragmatism there is pragmatism you know uh, i i remember just this morning when i was being interviewed on cnbc and i said that we should uh, uh, reduce the maximum marginal rate of tax other than me whoever was there on that panel said it can't happen in a political uh time when uh, elections are around the corner any concession given to rich will be harakiri and we saw that the government bit the bullet and reduced it so so really uh, i would say it's a very welcome budget uh, rather than put ratings and points all of that which is a fashion i would say it's a very very welcome budget consistency and pragmatism these are not two words you usually associate Uh, with, with finance bills and tax provisions, uh, but Dinesh Bhai has beautifully summed it up. So, uh, on behalf of International uh, Tax Review, uh, Phil Myers, uh, Dhruva Advisors, Ajay Ranji, thanks for a wonderful presentation. There are so many comments which have come here saying, uh, you know, that the presentation was really incisive uh, and, and and useful to them. Uh, thanks, Ajay and, and Ranji, uh, for the exposition and. Uh, Dinesh Bhai, uh, many thanks for taking out your time and doing this uh, webinar for all our readers. Uh, once again, uh, thanks to all the patrons for for joining this webinar year after year, and uh, trust you enjoyed it as much as we've enjoyed it bringing it out to you. Stay tuned to Tax Sutra for roadblock coverage of uh, Union Budget 2023. Yeah, just five hours after the budget, it all almost feels like an eternity. Thank you, everyone. Good day.